sing your praise each and every day. I will celebrate your perfect love. I will lift my voice to the highest place. I will worship you, my God and King. I will sing your praise each and every day. I will celebrate your perfect love. I will lift my voice to the highest place. I will worship you, my God and King.
been a while since we've had this uh, conversation about in community um, because of technical difficulties and in-person meeting. Uh, but we are on part three of this in community message. And um, um, so let's go ahead and get started. Now, in the past, in the first couple of parts, we we discussed the fundamental realities of God as, as Father, Son, and Spirit, and how love is at the core of who He is. Now, this week, we're going to continue on that theme, and um, today we're going to look at how we, as a community of family members, um, you know, this is this is what God wants for us. So before we get started, are there any questions that you may have from the first couple of um, messages? No? Okay. Um, when, um, when we hear the message that God has for us, sometimes these messages or a study can be a bit uncomfortable for us. So before we get into this, Let's discuss a little bit about preaching, which will help put this study in its proper context. The word preach is the Greek word karuksen. I hope I didn't butcher that, but it's from the verb karuso. We can see an example of this in 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy verse 4, I'm sorry, chapter 4 verse 1, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead? And in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Preach the word. Karuksen ton Logan. Uh, Caruso means to make an official announcement. Announce. Make known by an official herald or one who functions as such. Now, heralds were men who were sent out on official business by a king, a governor, or the emperor himself to herald or proclaim an official message, and make that message known to the people. Heralds were not given any power to change or alter or modify the message that they'd been given. Preachers, according to this definition, are first and foremost heralds. They preach the word given to them by the king without altering the message. Let's look at Paul's letter to Titus, who was in Crete. False teachers were already a problem in the church at that time, and the letter focuses primarily on that issue. In this letter to Titus, Paul addresses the need for proper leadership, or elders, in chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. Let's look at what Paul says in verse 9. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Notice it's about the trustworthy message and not the person sharing that message. We all need to be faithful to the message to teach what God's word says, not add or subtract or edit that message, even if it makes us or the people who hear it uncomfortable. Now let's, let's go back to community, a, a community of family members. So I'm going to ask you guys, what do you think about when you think about your community of family members. I think about my family, my immediate family. What do you guys actually think about? I agree with you. There's a lot of, um, there's more than 72 ways of calling the church mm -hmm. in the Bible. But the one that relies on like, to me, makes more sense, is family. God is our father. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus calls us brother. And right. once we come to be born again, then mm -hmm. all of us are brothers. And then we are the bride. And Jesus is going to marry us in the um, lamb, um, um, you know, uh, in right. uh, the wedding. Um, so everything is like like a core group of a family. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the way I see um, community of faith called church. Right. And, now, if you're not in the church setting or if you are not a believer, most people would think family, a community of family members are their mom, their dad, their, bro their own brothers, their sisters, cousins, aunts, uncles. And that's not how Jesus viewed his community of family members. 
The Bible gives us many examples of how Jesus viewed family, and some of these verses can be very uncomfortable to hear. So let's look at Mark chapter 3. Jesus, um, what he's been doing is miracles, proving that he is God in the flesh, and it's becoming harder and harder to explain away for those religious leaders of his day. And so in verse 22, the teachers of the law have accused Jesus of doing his miracles by the power of Satan. And in verse 31, his mother and his brothers arrive. So let's read here, starting in verse 31. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone to in to call him. The crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. And his response, Who are my mother and my brothers? He asked. Then he looked at those seated in the circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. So how do we feel about how Jesus responded? Do you think he was being disrespectful to his, his mother and his brothers? And um, his response is essentially saying that his family are not his blood relatives, but all those who do God's will. For those of us who have assumed that Jesus is the family values champion, of which he is, this doesn't seem to really square with that image. Maybe this is an isolated incident. And so let's look at another place where Jesus talks about family. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 30, starting in 34, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemy will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So we value our relationships with family. But Jesus drew a clear line in the sand. The Bible says that if you love your father or mother or son or daughter more than Jesus, you are not worthy of him. Being a disciple of Jesus will entail taking up the cross and following him. Denying yourself, nothing can take priority, not even your family. For someone who believes in Jesus, this actually makes sense, but look at it from the uh, look at this verse from a perspective of one who doesn't know Jesus. As a non-believer, it's hard to love someone you don't know, and even harder when they want you to love them more than your own blood relatives. Okay, so let's look at another verse. So in um, Luke nine, verse starting in verse fifty-nine, he said to another man, "Follow me." But the man replied. Lord, first let me go bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one puts his hand to the plow and looks back, is fit for a service in the kingdom of God. This verse, These verses seem like Jesus is asked, um, this man to not only do something shocking and against traditional family values, but even violate the Mosaic commentary or commandment to honor your father and mother. For instance, in the Mishnah, which is a rabbinic commentary of the uh, Old Testament, Jews were told that the duty of a son uh, is to ensure his father honorable burial comes before other religious duties, even before the duty to recite the Shema, which is the Jewish confession of faith. Uh, made up of three scriptural texts from Deuteronomy and Numbers. But now Jesus is proclaiming that following him takes priority over bearing one's own father. No wonder the Pharisees and the Sadducees and other guardians of traditional family values were kind of in an uproar about Jesus. They thought he was a radical. In Jesus' view, literally everything was supposed to take a backseat to discipleship to him and proclaim and proclamation of the kingdom, including the highest family duties. So we see that the disciples discipleship 
Following Jesus is more than just praying a prayer of salvation. It's more than just being a good person. It is loving him supremely and putting nothing, not even our own family, our own children, our own parents above him. As Christians, doing the will of God includes honoring parents and loving our family. Jesus is telling us to love him above all else. In the above verses, Jesus is not, telling, uh, is not saying anything about separating husbands and wives. Clearly, Jesus is, is um, said in reference to marriage that what God has joined together, no one should separate. Remember from the first couple of studies, we learned Genesis 2.24, and they became one flesh. No one should come away from this uh, thinking that they should divorce an unbelieving spouse in order to follow Jesus more closely. In fact, Paul addresses this very question. In 1 Corinthians 7, verse 12, To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, if any brother has a wife who is not a believer, and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer, and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. So Jesus declares that all who do the will of God are his brothers, sisters, and mothers in Matthew twelve fifty. And in some ways, this family takes priority over our own families if those family members are not believers. But even in that, Jesus will care for us. Uh, Matthew 19, 27, Peter answered him. He's talking to Jesus. We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. The reason we will be taken care of is because we are part of Jesus' family. As we saw in the last study, a major study part of salvation is that we are adopted as children of God. In John 1, 12, yet to all who receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. And so we become a big family. Jesus tells us in Matthew twelve fifty that Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my and mother. God's vision for community is that we would be a family. So how do we include each person in our community as part of the family? Um, well, we, we start with treating them with respect and purity. In 1 Timothy 5.1, do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Paul tells us to treat our elders with respect, like we would a father or mother. Treat your younger men as brothers and younger women as sisters. And if you continue reading in 1 Timothy 5, Paul tells us that we need to take care of widows, which is a big emphasis in the Bible. James also addresses this issue. In verse 27 of chapter 1, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Secondly, we need to um, prioritize, prioritize caring for your church family as if they were your own. In Galatians 6 um, verse 9, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. We, do, uh, we should do good to all, but especially to our family of believers. These are not just people who go to church with you, but according to the Bible, they are your brothers and sisters, your mother. In John 13, 34, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples 
if you love one another. Jesus even uses the term brothers in Matthew 25, 31 through 40. He tells us that when he returns to his, with his glory, with all the angels and sit on his throne in heavenly glory, he will say to those who are his disciples, come, you who are blessed by my father. He says, everything we do to help others, like feeding the hungry, giving water to the thirsty, inviting a stranger into our home, clothing those who need clothes, we do for him. Verse 40 reads, the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of these, the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. This is how we are to treat family of believers. This is how we share and how we show the love of God throughout Stanford. And thirdly, um, share your life one, with one another. Paul tells us in his letter to the Thessal uh, Thessalonians how we need to care for each other and how we are to share our lives with each other. In 1 Thessalonians 2, um, though we could have asserted our authority as apostles of Christ, but we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly uh, cares for her own children. In the same way, we had a fond affection for you and we delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become very dear to us. Community is not just about showing up and doing your religious duty or hearing a message. It is about being a part of the family of God, regardless of what your family was like. In this family, the hope is that we would share lives together so that we might grow in our love for Jesus and love for others. We are all part of the family of God, so let's treat each other with respect. Let's care for each other and share our lives with each other so that the world will know that we belong to Jesus. So in summary, uh, when we are sharing God's word, we need to make sure that we put forth a trustworthy message. There are uncomfortable truths in the Bible and we can't alter God's word just to make it comfortable for us or for the people we are sharing the gospel with. We need to welcome people to be part of our family, treat each other with respect, care uh, for each other, and share our lives together. So. Next time, we're going to continue the series on in community, and we're going to look at the first Christian community in the book of Acts. So throughout this week, if you are reading, uh, if you are reading some uncomfortable Bible passages, ask God to give you your um, insight and meditate on them. Also think about ways we can share our lives together and how we can care for each other.